Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the beginning of our biodiversity uh, diagnoses course. This is essentially a follow-on to several courses that we've done so far, uh, talking about um, capturing, cleaning, publishing, integrating, and analyzing um, biodiversity data. And so this course is, in, is designed to synthesize. Essentially, the idea of this course, as you know, is, is to produce uh, analyses of some reasonably large biodiversity data sets uh, from here in Africa. But first, what we'll do is to give you an introduction to the whole program. And it's, it's a little bit complicated. So I figure a, a short talk about essentially what this broader effort is all about. So let's ask, kind of, what is biodiversity informatics? Um, certainly it's a new field, although you could argue it's a very old field also. Um, Linnaeus's uh, <coughs> Systema Naturae in some senses was an information system, right? And it was a pretty good information system because it's lasted several hundred years. Um, but if we talk about informatics in a more modern digital sense, uh, biodiversity informatics is a very new field in that there are no textbooks, there are no kind of standard references, there's not even really any synthesis. Um, another thing is there are really to date no comprehensive training programs. Uh, I don't know of a graduate program anywhere in the world that gives you a start to finish view of biodiversity informatics. Um, and indeed, there are really few training resources. Um, there is not a stash of, or there was not a stash of um, digital materials anywhere that you can go and just teach yourself. So <coughs> this field is, is very new. And yet, as you all know, uh, biodiversity is crucial to conserving natural ecosystems, to managing natural resources, um, and then to all sorts of other dimensions of human interface with the natural world. So this field is this very strange overlapping of old and new. These are um, kind of some of the great museums around the world. And many of these buildings that you're seeing are very old. Um, and you know, that's, that's the old biodiversity informatics. Systematic collections, uh, their cataloging systems. Um, and in some ways, the, the techniques that we use are still the same ones that were used 100 years ago. Um, these are just some scenes from the museum that I curate, which is um, focused on, on birds. Uh, and really, many of the, of the techniques that we use are exactly the same as were being used in the 1890s. Um, the crucial elements are field catalogs and um, this this informatics technique of capturing data by hand. Uh, we still use India ink on 100% rag paper. Um, in the old days, we would double capture all data, a specimen tied to the legs of the bird and a paper catalog. Now, with the advent of the digital age, we take along computers, and so now we triple capture all of the data. We still do the specimen tag tied to the foot of the bird. We still do the paper catalog and we capture the data digitally so that we don't have to when we get back. So it's a very strange system. These old leather bound ledgers were still being used um, even in the museum, uh, which is to say even after you got back, when I got to the University of Kansas in the early 1990s, we were still capturing the data in 
the old biodiversity informatics system. And you can see some poor technician had to write out each record in the museum. Um, we also had connected, uh, you could call them a relational database, but these are field notes and with a system that was developed mainly at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, each of these field notes comes in three sets. One set is species accounts where you summarize each night before you go to bed in the field. You summarize what you've learned about each species. A second one is your gazetteer, where you document where you went. And these catalogs have beautiful pictures from the early 20th century across whatever region they were working in. And the third is your actual catalog, where you provide the pre-edition of those specimen data. And so each collector was not only double capturing the data from the specimens, but also he or she was triple producing field notes. It was a very complicated management system. Very few institutions did it well. And all of it was sitting in analog state in a lot of And in fact, we keep ours in AC. And the idea, which I think is a lie, was that if the museum burned down, the safe would sink down to the high stories of the museum and be recoverable with all the data. I think that's not true. But hopefully we'll never find out. So these are what our specimens look like. Um, there's one of those information capture systems. Uh, egg specimens. And you can see the old and the new. Um, in this case, the handwriting's a bit better, but also, more importantly, the information is richer. Okay, many old specimens will say, you know, East Africa, or you know, Uganda, or maybe they say Entebbe, but they don't say exactly where. Are we down on the lake shore, or inland? I guess everything's inland here, but farther away from the lake. Um, that sort of rich data, also rich ancillary specimens, samples of parasites, samples of uh, habitat, photographs of habitat, some of our specimens go into alcohol. And then we have another problem, which is that you really can't put a good information-rich tag. And so a lot of them get these, these codes, which are just linkages amongst fields in a relational database. Okay? And then when, when we get to the end of the process, they're organized in, um, in a scientific collection. These are fruit doves from Southeast Asia. Uh, and those are in large specimen cabinets, which are putatively inert and provide no acidic environment for the specimens. My office, in some senses, is down at the end of that hallway. Um, and then we can come out of that 19th century world and into a 21st century world. And we can talk about uh, automating data capture. This is a, a technician working with capturing data from herbarium sheets, uh, or capturing images of insects. Um, and so this, this 21st century system is, is pretty exciting. Um, Brazil, for example, has gotten together, I think it's 80-some herbaria, and essentially integrated their data not their collections. It's very nice to have the herbaria spread across the whole country. But the data are very nicely integrated in this virtual herbarium of um, plants and fungi. And you can do a query and see how many records and how many of those are georeferenced. 
uh, and even which of them have images and which of them are mapped. And so you can very quickly review all of the specimens of, of whatever plant you're interested in uh, from any, any herbarium across Brazil. And in fact, many of us save up specimens for when we can go to uh, the big reference collections to compare with type specimens. Well, with this system, you can say, well, here's a paratype. I'll pull up the image of that and compare my specimen to the paratype. Not perfect, right? You don't have the plant or the bird or whatever in hand, but it's a lot better than waiting five years before you can travel to Paris or travel to Rio de Janeiro or wherever to make this comparison. So these are very exciting times. Um, we can also automate several of the steps of, of data management and data improvement, um, such as this with automating georeferencing. And so this is a system that was developed by um, some colleagues across the US. But essentially the idea is your, the, the system is given a text string. In this case, it's Brazil. And this pretty am ambiguous term, sorry, Rio de Janeiro. You all have heard of Rio as a beautiful city. You probably saw World Cup games played there. But Rio de Janeiro is also a state. And in fact, its dimensions changed as a state over Brazil's history. But then we get this additional piece of information of five kilometers north of Teresópolis. And Teresópolis is this inland city, kind of up in the mountains from Rio de Janeiro. And so this system takes that string, it's going to guess that this is not the city version of Rio de Janeiro, but rather the state, because we have another city reference. But then it gives us three different guesses as to what that string means. And somebody who knows Brazil can then go in and say, uh, we should go with version C, okay? But this is a lot faster and a lot more effective than going in and doing it by hand, as many of you know as you prepare these data sets. We can also automate some of the procedures for improving the data in the sense of catching problems. Um, this is essentially a view of all of the data in the Brazilian system, which is called Species Link. And where you see dark red, you're seeing lots and lots of records. And where you're seeing the images of the Earth, you're seeing no records. Okay, and it makes a lot of sense that Brazilian herbaria would have mostly Brazilian data. You can see some holdings from Africa, uh, sorry, from Australia. Now, what about this right here in East Africa and in the Indian Ocean? Anybody have an idea what that is? Do you know how we designate longitude in, in GIS applications? Our half of the world is negative and your half of the world is positive in terms of longitude. Well, some of us on the other side of the world forget about that. And so, in your mind, take Brazil and flip it like this across the prime meridian. Those are Brazilian records. Okay? Now, what about this cross right here in the middle? When we did our course in Ghana, um, one of our instructors who had worked for years and years on georeferencing technology insisted on going to the beach and swimming out as far as he could because he wanted to be close to that point. What is that point? He didn't get very close. What is that point? You know this. Zero latitude, zero longitude. Right? So what is this cross? <laughs> 